Due to recent developments, there's been a change in our scheduled programming. Now joining John in this preview is Dr. Karen Meach. Dr. Meach leads the astrobiology research team at the University of Hawaii and specializes in planetary astronomy, in particular with the study of distant comets and their relation to the early solar system. Dr. Meach recently led the characterization of the first interstellar object, Oumuamua, which was discovered by the Pan-STARRS Observatory Telescope. Dr. Meach, welcome to the program. Hi, thank you. Now, Dr. Meach, um, the strange object that passed through the solar system, Oumuamua, is the first time we've ever detected an object that is interstellar in nature. It comes from somewhere else. Um, how did you guys discover that? How did you spot it? Well, it was through the course of the normal near-Earth object survey that's conducted by the PanSTARRS telescope in Hawaii. And the team had gotten the data in as usual. And then on October 19th, they noticed an object that was uh, moving very rapidly with respect to the stars, which is typical of a near-Earth object. And so they looked in the previous day's data and found it there, but it wasn't picked up automatically because there were only a couple of images. And so immediate follow-up from various stations suggested that it might have an interesting orbit, but that was immediately discarded as probably having errors that were too big. But by the 22nd of October, um, our team follows up these things with the Canada-France-Hawaii telescope. That's when the head of the NEO survey, uh, Richard Wainscote, called me at home and said, I think we have an object that's interstellar. And that's when we got excited and put the whole machinery into motion to get telescope time. Now, with Oumuamua, how, how visible was it? Because I, I know it was seen after it passed Earth. Is this at the threshold of what we can detect as far as objects that pass by Earth nearby? No, it was um, not terribly faint at the time of discovery, but anything on an orbit like this that passes very close to the sun, effectively a, a long period type orbit, um, doesn't stay in the vicinity of the sun very long. So it was moving really fast. And because these things shine by the reflected light from their surface, that means their brightness drops very quickly. So when it was first uh, seen, it was at its brightest and easily detectable with even small telescopes, but then it dropped in brightness very rapidly. So the professional astronomers had maybe 10 days where it was relatively uh, easy to do the science. And then our very last observations were January 2nd, but that required um, a lot of orbits with Hubble Space Telescope. Now it varied in brightness, right, as well, which initially led people to think that it maybe was an elongated object that was tumbling or doing something like that in order to create changes in brightness. What's the current thinking on that? Well, the light curve, which is um, what, how we describe the brightness variations over time, at first seemed to be varying by about 7.3 hours. But what was, and that's not unusual, everything rotates and everything in the solar system has a light curve. But what was unusual was the range in brightness variation, which was a factor of 10. And there's very few asteroids in our solar system that have brightness variations uh, as big as that. And so that led us to speculate that it was possibly as elongated as a ratio of 10 to 1. <clears throat> now, as more and more teams started to get data, they were reporting different periods of variation, which didn't seem compatible with ours. And when you put it all together, it turns out that it's in what we call an excited rotation state. It's not really tumbling because that's sort of a chaotic process. But excited means that it's rotating, if you imagine a pencil, it's rotating around the short axis, as you would suspect, but it's also rolling around the long axis, and that long axis is nodding up and down. And many comets exhibit this type of behavior, and we speculated that this object could have this excited rotation as a consequence of its ejection from its home solar system. Now, how do you differentiate that from something like if it's an albedo difference, say it has a dark side versus a light side, you know, um, like some some of the moons in the solar system have. How do you tell the difference between that and something that's, you know, spinning? 
Um, that's relatively easy by the shape of the light curve. Oumuamua's light curve, um, the shape was very rounded and broad on the top with a deep, narrow V at the bottom. And that's always a signature of a shape light curve, typically something that's elongated or in a couple of pieces, whereas something that would have just a bright side and a dark side. For example, Saturn's moon Iapetus is really bright on one side, really dark on the other. And that light curve looks more symmetrical, like a sine wave. And so it's from the shape of the light curve that you can tell the difference. So this object presumably originated in a star system far away that was maybe a protoplanetary disk or early in its you know life. Is, the, is that excited rotation, is that from that star system? I mean, did that actually set this thing off moving or or is it something that happens in the interstellar medium? I suspect it was something that happened as it left its solar system. Uh, things that, you know, during the birth process of a young star system, there will be a lot of collisions and that could certainly give it an excited rotation state. Many of the, the small bodies in our solar system that have excited rotation states, namely comets, get this excited state because they have uneven outgassing. You know, the, the ices, and the, the gas don't come off the surface uniformly. It comes out like little rocket thrusters and that can give it an excited state. But we think in the case of Oumuamua um, that it probably achieved it from its home solar system and not from the interstellar medium. There wouldn't be anything that would excite it in deep space so what about an origin for for it? I mean, it it has a strange shape. Um, what what exactly um, is there any good hypothesis of you know is this a piece of a planet? Is this you know what is this as far as what we know? What what can you infer that this might be? Well. Personally, I think one of the most intriguing things that still needs an explanation is its strange shape. And I should mention that how we get the shape from the light curve uh, depends completely on how it's rotating. So the description of a 10 to 1 axis ratio is fine if it's in a simple state of rotation. Um, there's also phase effects, like how much of the object's side is illuminated, for example, uh, half half of a moon you wouldn't give a axis ratio of that one of one to one you'd say it's one to two uh, we didn't take account of the phase effect so it could be a little less elongated but also the direction at which the rotation axis is pointed will give you a difference in the shape and that could make it longer now that being said in an excited state um, mike belton and his colleagues had pointed out that the shape could actually be more of a flattened oval rather than a, a cigar shape. So we've got a variety of shapes, and then a lot of teams have tried very diligently to figure out what could cause this. Uh, one researcher, Sean Raymond, thought it could be tidal disruption during the formation of a young solar system. For example, if you remember when Shoemaker-Levy 9 passed close enough to Jupiter, it got tidally disrupted and completely torn apart. Uh, Sean suggested maybe this happened to Oumuamua and it got stretched. Um, others talk about maybe this was a fragment during the death throes of a, a solar a star, namely a supernova could have shredded planetary material. Um, there were some other exotic ideas, maybe a disruption in a white dwarf system or a binary star system, or maybe during the phase when a star evolves and gets uh, bigger and bigger and bigger at the end of its lifetime, that could have melted some material and uh, created this shape. And then another interesting one um, considers that maybe it had a normal, more normal shape, but as it was passing through the interstellar medium, abrasion from dust uh, w effectively whittled it down into this narrow needle-like shape. So there's a variety of ideas, and I think what's been very interesting with Oumuamua is the rich set of ideas that are coming out of it. But I think the shape is one thing that we are not going to know how it came about. Maybe with the next one, we'll see. Now, if that's an interesting idea, an interesting concept, a a planet that's been shredded by a supernova, and a piece of it flies by us, um, what would that do to an object? I mean, would it 
other than changing its shape, but what would it do? I mean, could you go and study supernovas from this object? Well, it, ideally, I would have loved to have gotten information on more information on the chemistry, on isotopes, because isotopes are really good tracers of the his, history of an object. But isotopes require very bright objects or a lot of gas or being up close and personal with the object and so that sort of information there was no chance of getting with something that was only visible for effectively a, a little over a week um, so you know supernova i don't know what it would do you'd certainly have a lot of um perhaps radioactive material but i'm not convinced that a piece of a planet would survive that process so i i really don't know it was an intriguing idea <laughs>